The NC State baseball team is 13-3 overall, and this past weekend, the Wolfpack opened ACC play with a successful series, winning two out of three over the Boston College Eagles, and we're here to talk Wolfpack baseball on Around the Bases. I'm Tony Haynes. He is NC State baseball coach Elliot Avent. These are our beautiful chicken wings from Backyard Bistro, and uh, it's it's become a major part of Around the Bases, the uh, teriyaki wings, the boneless version of the wings because Elliot Avent probably eats more chicken than Wade Boggs. Are we right about that? Yes. Okay. So yes. he's on record saying he eats as much chicken at least as Wade Boggs. But we talked about the pack is 13 and 3. Coming up this week, State will host UNC Asheville in a couple of games on Tuesday and Wednesday. Both of them start at Doak Field at 3 o'clock. And then NC State goes on the road to play three at Clemson on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Among other things, the man sitting to my left here recently won his 800th game at NC State, which is a terrific milestone. I know you didn't make a big Thank deal you. about no, it, no. but the people around you did, and it was well-deserved attention. What kind of reaction did you get after winning that 800th? Um, just a lot of stuff from former players, mostly former players, some coaches, um, you know, throughout the years. I, you know, I started my career out in the West Coast, and uh, – out in New Mexico, and I still got lots of friends out there. So you hear from people you hadn't heard. It gives them an opportunity. They've thought about texting you for a while about whatever just to catch up, so it gives them a reason to text. So a lot of former players, a lot of former coaches, and uh, and that was kind of nice. And then, you know, Debbie Al and Raymond Harrison honored me before the game, which I had no idea. Chris Hart came in the locker room and said, I think you better get out there. <laughs> and uh, they, um, it was a really nice – you know, I don't like to be honored for the game. I don't like kind of stuff like that. But what they gave me was very, very nice. There is a thing, it's just kind of a thing with my picture on it. But every player signed it. So that, nice. that's something that will always mean a lot to me. When you do reach one of those milestones, is that the most gratifying part of it, hearing from those players over the years that helped you get there? Yeah, if you, if you get in this business for the right reason, and most people did in uh, those days, uh, you got into the game when there wasn't any money in the game and you kind of just wanted to coach and, and make players better and, and help their lives. And and so that is a reward when you hear from a former player. I hope you do have unlimited texting on your phone plan, though. I do. That's a good thing. All right, let's uh, get to baseball. Boston College came in over the weekend. The Wolfpack won on Friday. Then you had to play two on Saturday. That was the split of the doubleheader. How would you characterize the first ACC series? Well, it's just like they all are. They're They're extremely tough, and there's no – the, the thing about the ACC in the last, I don't know, five, six years, there's not an easy team in the league. In the old days, the top half was very, very tough, but you could count on always winning two out of three on some teams in the bottom half and maybe getting a sweep in there occasionally, and uh, those things don't exist anymore. So every team is tough. Boston College has always been tough on us, and uh, it seems like uh, this, Andrew, this Jacob Stevens guy, we've never hit That's him tough. ever. We've never hit him. And when he's on, he's tough, and he was extremely on that game. But we were fortunate that Brian Brown was equally as on, and he gave us a chance, and then we got the uh, big hit in the eighth inning. Yeah, I know we'll talk about Brian Brown a, a little bit later on here because he has been phenomenal early in the season, almost perfect for NC State. And this is one of those series, though, uh, where you got together with uh, the administration at NC State and perhaps ACC's involved in this because you saw the – forecast for inclement weather on Sunday. It looked like a sure thing for rain on Sunday, so the decision was made to play two on Saturday because the goal is always to play a full series, a three-game series in the ACC. Just kind of take us through that process and how those decisions are made. Well, it's just, you know, people are always giving you weather forecasts. It's, it's kind of – and anybody that's ever dealt with me knows I don't like weather forecasts because I, <laughs> I just don't think they – I'm not saying ever get them right, but I think it's an impossible thing to get right. You know, I just believe – that it changes a lot. So I don't really go by the weather that much. I go by temperature. I think they get the temperature right for some reason, and they get the rain wrong most of the time. Matter of fact, uh, I, I thought about practicing yesterday because uh, uh, Bobby Lutz came down and watched our doubleheader, and then he spent the night in my house, and we barbecued a couple chickens and stayed at about 2 o'clock in the morning trying to figure this. He helps me walk through things and figure my team out. And, you know, we got up the next morning and, and had breakfast, and, we're kind of walking and stuff, and uh, I said, Bobby, I think we can practice today because we need to get a practice in, and and uh, but uh, I don't. We changed it 
based on temperature more than anything because it was supposed to be really cold yesterday. But I never thought it really got cold yesterday until late either. But uh, today is obviously miserable. So fortunately, we have the indoor football facility, and we're going to go over there. At, we're hitting the cages mm -hmm. in a little bit, and then we're going to go to the indoor f football facility about 3, 3 o'clock and try to get some stuff in. You know, as I said, the goal is always to play a full three-game series in the ACC if you can. But you look back at the end of the year, some teams play more games than others because of rainouts and, and weather issues. Coaches don't necessarily like doubleheaders, but in this case you had to play one. In, in what ways, if at all, does a doubleheader alter pitching plans? Well, right now everybody knows we got some we got some injuries in our pitching staff, and we're limited with our pitching staff, and it – keeps getting a little bit worse. And uh, so what you, you do with pitching is, <clears throat> you, matter of fact, we may change Brian Brown. Now, I don't like to change things because Brian's pitching so well and you like to keep guys in routines, but you need to be able to pitch your bullpen on Friday and bring them back on Sunday. So if you play a double header, that means you don't bring them back. You know, so whoever you pitch on Friday now, um, fortunately, Brian did so well on Friday it saved us a little bit, but double headers are just hard. Mm -hmm. They're hard on the pitching. It's hard.
We're back around the bases, and we're taping from Backyard Bistro. He is NC State baseball coach Elliot Amen. I'm Tony Haynes. The Wolfpack has two non-conference games coming up on Tuesday. UNC Asheville into the Doak at 3 o'clock Tuesday, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. And then the pack hits the road for what's always a tough road trip, quality baseball program, the Clemson Tigers coming up on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We were uh, talking previously about any number of subjects. We had to take a little break. It was a chicken wing break. The plate is... Well, it was a full plate earlier. <laughs> now it's not. But let's uh, talk about, we're talking about pitching. And uh, right now, NC State, the staff has the fewest walks in the ACC. But there were seven walks in the game, first game Saturday, eight walks in game two on Saturday. And guess what? More runs were scored by the opponent. So <laughs> needless to say, there's always a correlation between the, the walks and the amount of runs are scored, right? And that's no why question. it drives you, you coaches crazy when your, your pitchers are walking batters. We've had 16 games this year. We've had three games. Where we've had walks like you're talking about. And except for those three games, which one of them we won, and I don't think we gave up a run in that game. We had like nine walks and then give up a run. I don't know how that's possible. But we have stayed away from – we've had three or fewer walks in every game except those three games, and that's how we've been, we've been winning because it looks like we're playing good defense. We're filled in like 971. I just saw the stats that Justin gave me, and sometimes stats are very misleading for a coach. We're not fielding 971 either. We're not we're not as good defensively as the sad show. We we have plays we do not make still. So the reason we've been winning is we are swinging the bat fairly well, and uh, our pitchers are not walking anybody. How much do you like your power on this team? Oh, it's good. I mean, I think we're probably leading the ACC in home runs. Probably um, we got a lot of home runs, and you know they matter. I mean, especially we've hit some big home runs. Like Kenny hit one in the game. I think Kenny and Debo hit one in that game against Boston College in the second game. And it was, I'm not saying it's an, oh, by the way, they're still competing with their bats and you're trying to get better, but they don't help you win a ball game. But we've hit some big home runs, and none as big as one will hit in the first game on Friday, but we've hit some big home runs in this game. And it makes pitchers afraid to make a mistake to our lineup, mm -hmm. which should create more walks. We've got to get more walks as a team offensively to get better. 31 home runs as a team, and that does lead the ACC. Now, in baseball, and the beauty of the game, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. There's the Earl Weaver brand of baseball. Remember Earl Weaver? He wanted the three-run homer. There's Whitey Herzog. He, he liked to build his team around manufacturing runs and speed and stealing bases, small ball, hit and run. Uh, you've had both here at NC State, and you have to adjust to your personnel. This looks like uh, the Bass Brothers here reincarnated on your team. Do you have a preference? Do you like the Earl Weaver style better or the Whitey Herzog style? Well, when I got here, I was accused of liking the Earl Weaver style, three-run homer. And Ray Tanner was accused of the same thing. What, what every coach wants to do is obviously play to your personnel. We talked about that all morning in the office this morning. That's all we talked about, how we can get better offensively. And uh, But uh, what you want to do is be do as many things possible to win. I want more base runners. I want more walks. I want our hitters to get in deeper counts without being non-aggressive. You know, I don't want them to lose their – but we've got to find ways to – I think we have a reputation for stealing bases. We stole a lot of bases this year, more than I usually steal, except when Trey Turner was here. And But as a team, we're collectively stealing more bases. If you can make a pitcher think about what's going on, always pitch from the stretch, think about what might happen. This guy might steal a base. They may hit it and run. We may do more things. If you can make a pitcher think, then you have an edge. And that's what we're trying to do right now is become a multifaceted team where we can do all things. I remember Trey Turner's freshman year like it was yesterday and uh, how pitchers would become so distracted uh, by him. He would be over there. They'd throw over there five or six times. Uh, sometimes they'd throw it away. Or they'd obviously, as you say, they'd make a bad pitch. Is, uh, is he the most disruptive force you ever coached? Best player I've ever coached, and I've never used the word best. I think it's a wrong word to use because it offends a lot of people when you say that. Like Josh McClain is one of the best center fielders I've ever had, but I'm not going to offend anybody I've ever had because I had Kyle Wilson and <laughs> Brett Williams and, you know, Jake Fincher. I'm not going to offend anybody, Matt Camp, by saying somebody's the best. But in Trey Turner's case, he is the best player, and that's non-arguable that I've ever had. He may be close to becoming the best player in the National League, too, by yeah, the way. He may be. Yeah. He may be. Brett Kenman leads the nation in home runs. He has nine, batting 418, leads your team in RBIs. Did you see some signs his first few years 
that he could become a force like this. Yeah, his when he walked on campus his freshman year, I told Chris Hart, I said, Chris, this kid's unbelievable. And we had a lot of competition getting him. We got him early. Chris Hart does such a good job. I don't think you all understand how he identif- – we're asked to identify players so early just to have a chance to get these guys. So when you when you pull a Trey Turner out of uh, Florida, when you pull a Brett Kinnaman out of Pennsylvania, and uh, you have to make that decision very, very early. But when he got on campus, I said, this kid's got pop in his bat. He plays the game the right way. He's such a good person. He's such a throwback to the old days when guys did everything they were supposed to do and wanted to win at such a high level that uh, – and, uh, you know, he's just gotten off to a great start. But he knows it's tough. I mean, he had a tough weekend this weekend, and he takes it very personal. It's tough, especially when the other team bears down on you like they bear down on him. One of the uh, many cliches we sportscasters like to use is the light went on for him. You know, the light goes on. Or Jericho Cotre, you know, his third year, the light went on. Or uh, Omer Yurtseven for basketball this year after a tough freshman season. Uh, he he figured it out. Why has the light come on for Brett Kinnaman this year? I'll tell you, there's Alex Cheek sitting in our audience right now. And Alex was a great pitcher for Coach Esposito, who to me, and, you know, he's totally responsible for any baseball success I've had here, Ray Tanner had here. It all started with Alex Cheek, uh, Mike Caldwell, Chris Kamak, and uh, Francis Combs, and, and Coach Esposito. They started this thing. And uh, Coach Esposito used to tell me all the time, Elliot, you think you talk to a player about doing something, doing something, doing something, you feel like you're beating your head against the wall. He seems like he doesn't understand what you're talking about. And you do it for six weeks, and one day you walk out there, and he looks like he's been doing it his whole life. I remember Coach Esposito taught me that, and it's so very true. You mentioned Omer Yard 7, great example. Brett Kinnaman. Um, like Brock Dethridge, I don't know whether you all saw this weekend, but for, he's one of the fastest people in college baseball. He's left-handed, and he's such an emotional guy, but he has worked on bunting his whole time because mm-hmm. we, we feel like he could bunt every time in that bat for all season and maybe hit 500, you know, and he has struggled getting that bunt down. And then last week in practice, all of a sudden, it's like he gets it down every time. And it's amazing. You think he's been trying to drive you crazy for three years, but it takes time in this game to figure it out. And uh, it's, it's really fun when you watch guys work hard and figure it out. And a guy that can bunt like that with that kind of speed, he's a total nightmare for a team defensively, isn't he? Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. Let's talk about uh, Brett Kenneman in spot relief. He's been used as a pitcher. Not much. He's a couple of, I don't know how many batters he's faced, three or four. Uh, what's the story behind him being used uh, as a part-time pitcher? Well, he was a really good pitcher in uh, high school. And he's always, you know, said he'd pitch here if we needed him. And Chris Hart's always wanted me to pitch him. And, you know, we've had so many injuries this year. I gave it a shot. <clears throat> and uh, he was really, really good in the outings we used him in preseason. And then he's been out in two outings now for us, and it hasn't been too good. And, but it's hard coming out of left field, and you don't really get time to warm up. And he's such a competitor. He just wants to go out there and help the team. He's got a really good breaking ball. But, you know, the two times he's gone out there, he's had difficulty throwing strikes. And so, you know, this is, it's something we may still use. But uh, And uh, if we don't get some guys back healthy, we may have to. But uh, he's willing to do anything to help the ball club win. I've always, and, I've always been amazed by those guys who be position players for seven or eight innings in college and then come in and close the game. You had the kid, uh, and uh, I'm old now. The name escapes me. From Washington State, he played shortstop for you. With oh, Chad Orvella. Chad Orvella. Yeah. That's, and he got, that's and, a special and, talent. And to, he got drafted that. as he played shortstop for two years here and gets drafted as a pitcher in pro ball and pitched in the big leagues, made it to the big leagues as a pitcher, and he was only like five foot eleven, but he only pitched a handful of innings here. It's amazing. Yep, and I remember that. And then he, he got all of the major leagues too, right? J.T. Jarrett, Greensboro, freshman, batting uh, 333 early in the season. He had three hits in game one on Saturday. What do you like about that young man? That he does everything the right way. He's very consistent. And uh, we were actually going to redshirt him. He, uh, you know, we got Steve Patera, who has been top of our lineup, our steady Eddie. He's the glue that makes us, whatever the straw that stirs the drink, whatever you want to call it. He's that guy for us. And, uh, when we figured out he needed surgery in four to six weeks just to get over surgery, and then he's got to get back to to being proficient. I mean, we knew we had a problem. I went to to uh, JT and said, hey, do you still want to, you know, I was going to redshirt you. You knew that. What do you think? And he said, coach, if I can help this ball club, let's go. And uh, we played him, and I said, hey, you know, you play, and 
it may not work. He may not play well. And then you got, mm -hmm. then I got Vasquez there. And then when Patera comes back, I'm obviously going to give him a shot. But, you know, he's played very, very well and been a big plus for us the last few weeks. Steven Patera, as we know, we saw it last year, uh, just a <laughs> terrific leadoff hitter. He gets up there with the mindset that he's going to see a lot of pitches, a lot of deep counts, draws a lot of walks. He has, I guess, the ideal approach for a leadoff hitter. But now with him out of the lineup, Josh McClain has been your, your leadoff man. Do you at all ask Josh to change his approach now that he's a leadoff hitter? No, if I did, I think I'd make him a worse player. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love for him to take more pitches, but I'd love for him to take more pitches if he were down in the order, too, mm -hmm. or hitting third. He's just an aggressive guy, much like Andrew Kisner and, uh, was here. And, uh, you know, over time he will take more pitches, but right now he's just aggressive, and that's what makes him good. So you don't want to – you don't want to do that like Samson cut his hair or whoever that guy was that cut his hair and it didn't work out. So you don't want to change what he does well. And uh, But Steve Patera at the top of the line really did work for us. Mm -hmm. Evan Edwards, uh, you've had a platoon going at first base, and he's taken advantage of his opportunities, batting 366 with five homers, a, a Juco product. Uh, was he already fairly polished when you got him here? Yeah, he was a dangerous, dangerous hitter in junior college. We thought he'd get drafted and signed, but he came here. And uh, he had 18 homers, I think, last year in junior college. He's just a dangerous hitter. Scouts got their eye on him. He's a good defensive first baseman, as you can see some of the plays he's made. And uh, But with him and, and uh, Shane Shepard, and then uh, Stephen Oakley's having the best time, you know, since he's been here. This has been the best he's played. We got three guys there at first base that can play very, very well. But uh, Evan Edwards is a dangerous guy in our lineup. And what he does, he gives you somebody in that four-hole behind Will Wilson, behind Brett Kinnaman, so they can't pitch around anybody. All right, team has played just one road game to this point. Now you hit the road this weekend. A uh, tough place to play always because it's a tough place to play because they have a good team, right? Right. Uh, are you really interested to see how your club responds on the road this weekend? Not really. I'd rather stay here and, <laughs> and still worry about that. But I uh, I just – Clemson's just playing so well. I'm not worried about how we're going to play on the road. We'll respond fine to that, I think. Clemson's just very good. And what – when you it's it's about your schedule, who you're playing, number one. So when you look at basketball schedules now, football schedules, you and I talk about all the time. We can almost tell you who's going to win the league mm -hmm. when you look at who they miss and who they play and where they play them. But the other thing that people don't factor in is when you play somebody. And right now, Clemson's just red hot. They feel like they can't lose, and that's so uh, we're going to have to be very, very, very good this weekend. All right, uh, before we go, because we like talking about the former players here, and I thought <laughs> before we leave today. Uh, because some of your uh, guys who are in the big leagues are working their way towards the big leagues, uh, they're in spring training right now. They're about three weeks away from the start of the regular season. Uh, I'm sure you stay in touch with them most, if not all of the time. Uh, guys like Brett Alston and Carlos and Trey, and uh, you, you mentioned Andrew Kisner. Uh, what's what's the update with those guys as they're getting ready for uh, another professional season? No, they're playing very, very well. Some of them just left. Some of them have been there for a while. Carlos is still nursing a little bit of injury with his shoulder, but uh, the bursitis in his shoulder. But the uh, Trey has gotten off to a very, very good start, and Andrew Kisner's been unbelievable. I got to see him actually play on TV about three times. And I talked about how he swung at everything when he was here. Now he takes pitches all the time. It's really funny. He's walked a few times. But uh, they worked so hard in the offseason, all those guys. And it's nice to see them have a lot of success. And the nice thing is they still love their Wolfpack. I mean, they follow us. They text me and say, Coach, big win. Coach, congratulations on this, that. These guys love their NC State Wolfpack. They're glad they went to school here. And we follow them equally as well. And they're just good people. I think for all NC State fans, when they have a chance during their summer months to turn on a major league game and they see one of uh, our former players in the big leagues, because you know that's a dream fulfilled for them. But for you, who was intimately involved in developing these guys and putting them on the road to the big leagues, what what is it like for you when you turn on a, a big league game on the summer and you see one of your former guys playing in the major leagues? Uh, the first thing I think about is their work ethic. Like, I'm so glad because I love to see people work hard and then things work out for them because we know you're not guaranteed that. Mm -hmm. The game will never give you back as hard as you work. It'll only give you back a little portion, and that's got to be good enough for you because it's such a difficult sport. But when I see a guy that's achieved their dream, you know what I'm saying? And when I see them, I think about all the hours they spent working for it and the lesson that it's going to teach them in life. They're going to have kids. They're going to be married. They're going to have other things they got to – they they understand work ethic does make things happen, 
And so I know I'm so happy for him because Kisner, Trey Turner, Brett Austin, you would not believe how hard those guys work. Palmero, you just wouldn't mm -hmm. believe it. It's a good way to end. Coach, thank you for your time. Good luck uh, coming up this week. Have a busy week, five ball games. Thank you very, very much. And it's always good being with you, Tony. Elliott A. Event, the UNC Asheville coming in on Tuesday, Wednesday, 3 o'clock starts, then the road trip to Clemson Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And don't forget, mark it down. Our next uh, round of bases from Backyard Beast Row will be on April 16th. And then the final chapter will be in May. That'll be on May 7th. For the coach, I'm Tony Haynes. Enjoy your week.